this is Miss Litton, and this is the review of both chapters 17 and 18. So we're going to go speedy McSpeedy through this since we have two chapters to review. Everybody say hi. Hi. All right. So the very beginning of 17 differentiated between um, not that. Yes, that. Not that. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Not sorry. Um, it differentiated between micro and macro evolution. So I just want to remind you in your head, micro evolution is changes within the species and macroevolution would be changed to a whole new species. And when we talk about evolution, we really know we're talking about a change in what? Allele, Allele frequencies. Good. Okay, just checking on that. So then we had the whole question about what is a species and we kind of argued our way through all the different types of species, morphological, we talked about phylogenetic, but then we settled in on the biological species concept. And that part says if there's key parts, the key parts are that they interbreed, produce fertile offspring, and it happens in nature, wherever that is on there. And um, what is that, what's a problem with the biological species definition? You have to be sexual, right? Because if you're asexual, then you can't interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Does that make sense? Okay, so there are problems with the uh, biological species concept. We talked about subspecies um, as well, many, 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 many different forms of species. So then we talked about what are some isolating mechanisms? Why don't we just have one big, you know, like every horse has sex with, sex with every horse or, you know, any kind of um, hooved animal or something. That's gross. Um, but anyway, <laughs> what keeps the species separate? And so we talked about that there are um, two um, big categories of reproductive isolating mechanisms. Um, bless you. Prezygotic and postzygotic. So prezygotic is before a sperm and egg can fuse, right? And postzygotic would be after a sperm and egg have fused. Now, ideally, you don't want to waste energy or resources trying to mate with somebody that's a different species where it's not going to produce fertile offspring, right? So you want to stop it as far out as you can. So some of the things that contribute to um, um, this type of isolation, uh, prezygotic, let me go there, okay, is geographical or habitat isolation, just like, you know, I live in Kenya, you live in North America, so there's no interbreeding, right? I live on the east side of the mountain, you live on the west side of the mountain, so there's no interbreeding. So what keeps us separate is some sort of geographical barrier is keeping us separate. So that's um, habitat isolation. Then we talked about temporal isolation, and meaning we do live in the same neighborhood, but we just don't reproduce at the same time um, or the same season, and that's what keeps us separate. Um, the next one was behavioral isolation. Let's say we do live in the same location, we do breed at the same time, but we don't know how to read each other's signals in order to reproduce. So that's what keeps us separate. Do you see how we keep getting closer and closer and closer to producing an hybrid? So, and then the third one was mechanical isolation. Our parts don't fit together. We don't know how to way to join in order to um, put our gametes together. We just can't get our um, gametes to go from one organism to another organism because of mechanical isolation. Or we can get our parts to fit but the issue is, is that our sperm and egg are not compatible. Usually we don't have what? Receptors. Good. So those are all prezygotic. Postzygotic is really a, a waste of the animal's sperm and egg because it's not going to work out. Oh, not going to do that monster quiz. It's not, it's not going to work out because you end up forming a hybrid, but that hybrid is not viable. And either it doesn't live until the point where it's released out of the female body in some way, um, or it, it spontaneously aborts, and so the hybrid just doesn't live. Or the hybrid lives, but it's weaker and nobody wants to have sex with it. Or the hybrid lives and it's still strong, but it's infertile. Or the hybrid lives and it's strong and it's fertile, but its offspring aren't fertile. fertile. So that's um, F2. F1 is the first offspring. If it's sterile, F2 would be um, the second generation. So all of these are things that keep species separate. And remember, that's going to be key. Remember I gave you a little summary thing? 
that's going to be key if you're talking about reproductive isolation where you're saying the biological species concept says we only reproduce with each other in nature and produce viable offspring. This is what keeps them separate. So then we said, okay, what leads to that speciation, that difference, that reproductive isolation? What leads to that? And so we said the most common form of speciation is allopatric speciation. A river runs through it. There's some sort of barrier. And that's how I remember it. I think of allopatric. I look at these two L's right here and think a river right here separates us. So as a result of that river separating us, we have our own initial gene frequencies, our own selection pressures, our own mutations, and over time, and our own adaptations. So over time, we accrue differences. So even if we're back together, we don't want to mate. Okay? Questions so far on what I've said? Okay? Um, then we talked about sympatric speciation. Tell me if I'm going too fast, okay? Um, sympatric speciation, where are you? Sympatric speciation, it was, I was right next to you and you changed on me. And it could be like microhabitat differences. I now prefer the top of the leaf and you prefer the bottom of the leaf, so we never have sex anymore. But more than likely, it's due to what? Chromosome. Yeah, some sort of chromosomal change. And we talked about that there's two things that can happen. Okay? So, autopolyploidy and allopolyploidy. Now, Remember how we did allopatric speciation? Remember how there was a barrier? Same idea here with the two L's. There's a barrier. Two different species in, in, in allopolyploidy. And I gave my haploid gamete. You gave your haploid gamete. Our chromosomes don't line up because we're two different species, right? But if we double, now we have diploid pair. If we undergo a mitosis event, a mitotic event, so I'm one species, I, I give these five chromosomes, you're another species, let's say you give seven chromosomes. And they don't line up with each other. They're not homologous. But if each of these chromosomes replicate themselves and we stay within that zygote, now we have homologous pairs. They'd be identical, right? The two homologs, they'd be identical. But then you can undergo your own um, mutations and that can accrue differences over time. So that's allopolyploidy. Autopolyploidy, is, um, and again, when, when we talk about ploidy, polyploidy, both of these polyploidy, poly means more chromosomes, right? So you can, you're not losing, if you lost chromosomes, you'd probably, it wouldn't work out for you. You're just gaining chromosomes. And who doesn't that normally work out for? Yeah, animals, it doesn't work out for. Who does that work out for? Plants. Plants seem to be able to withstand changes in their chromosomes better than um, animals do. So autopolyploidy is I'm I'm the same plant, okay? I just did not I did I failed at um, anaphase one or anaphase two, so I have a bonus set of chromosomes. So um, when you have that, then you have a tetraploid, and that could be a, a new way a tetraploid, right? because I've doubled the amount of chromosomes, that could be a form of speciation, sympatric speciation. Okay, when we looked at allopolyploidy, we had this wheat plant and this wheat plant, totally different species. His diploid number is 28, so his haploid number is 14. His diploid number is 14, his haploid number is seven. They come together, his 14 are not homologous with this one seven but they doubled up their chromosomes and now they have a diploid number and this is a hybrid. And what you see with this allopolyploidy or even tetraploids, or I don't know what you call it, octoploids, if it's 8N, I really have no idea. Um, they usually have like here, maybe bigger wheat kernels or bigger fruit or the strawberries bigger, whatever that fruit is, the apple is bigger. And most of our um, like rice and wheat, all of those are polyploids. Okay. Um, so then this was a good graphic, I thought, because it differentiated. Why don't you practice? Yes. So for allopolyploidy, it's like usually um, like by like two species that are hybrids. How is it a cause of speciation? Oh, okay. It's a really good question. And it's good for the autopolyploidy too, because they can't back cross with the parent, because they have more chromosomes than their parent. Not that they'd have ac sex with their actual parents, but not that that's bad in the plant world but they would, couldn't go back to their original parent species because their chromosomes are no longer homologous. So like the F1 generation would be just like a whole new different species? Yes. Of the, okay. mm -hmm. 
it's more likely to back cross with the parents, um, possibly with the um, auto polyploidy, but not at all with the allo polyploidy. Because they're totally two different species hybridizing. And then the, like, the parent generation would just keep on... Going. Keep on keeping on, and that's how you would form. So with um, which one would you form two species, and which one would you form three... Would you have three species total? Autopolyploidy, original parent, non-disjunction, doubling of chromosomes, so you have two species, right? But in allopolyploidy, species one, species two, hybridize into species three. You would get three species. Do you see the difference? Whereas in autopolyploidy, it would be two. Check with your bobbin and make sure they understand that distinction. Make it make sense to you. It's not a memorization thing, it's a making sense. I've got like some sort of allergies hitting me. Can I just check on that and make sure everybody understands that? Do you need me to go over that one more time? Okay, no problem. I do. Let me, let me see if I can think of a simpler way to do this. Okay. So here I have species X, whose 2N number equals, let's say, 50. Okay? Non-disjunction fails to happen. So now I, and you, it should be, if it did it the right way, it would make gametes that have how many? 25, but because it did it, now it's making gametes that have 50. Do you need me? No. Okay, so if it has two gametes coming together with 50, then the new 2N of the now species Y, are you sure? Yeah. Okay, the new 2N of species Y would be what? 100, right? So now I have species X, the original parent plant, and now species Y, whose 2N is 100. You okay with that? Okay, let's say over here, that right there would be um, auto polyploidy. Okay, this is allo, okay? This takes species A, and let's say its 2N number equals 12, and it takes species, a different color, green, species B, and let's say it's 2N number equals 14. So what would its N number be? Seven. seven. And this one's N number would be what? Six. six. N equals six. So they get together. Let's make this sperm. Okay, and let's make this egg. Okay, and they come together in their species C. Species C, whose N number would, well, if we put them together, seven, well, we have to ultimately double it up because this seven is not homologous with this six. So when they form the zygote, initially, what's six plus seven? Thirteen. Thirteen. Those would have to go through mitosis, and now we're at what number? Twenty-six. Twenty-six. So their two N number would equal twenty-six. So now I have species A, B, and C. Here are my two parent species. Here's my new hybrid species, okay? So here I have three species total. Here I just have the original species X and then the diploid of that Y. Two diploids get, does that, now does that help? Okay, clarifying questions, concerns? Okay. So here, um, if we look to the left and we look to the right, what's the one on the left? Allopatric. And what's this one right here? So it happened right side by side. Okay? All right. Um, perfect. Okay? Now, adaptive radiation is when you have one parent species, and from that one parent species, they're exploiting a, a variety of different niches or habitats, and so you have this one parent sponsoring all these variations. That's like spokes on a wheel. That's adaptive radiation. Darwin's finches are typical of that. The Hawaiian honey creepers are typical of that. Um, one ancestral species, where here we were like, I'm a species, we're divided, and now we have two. This is like filling it all of these different niches in adaptive radiation. Okay, then we looked at um, convergent evolution. We said to be careful of convergent evolution because they, it's more than likely we're just dealing with our environment in the same place we converged on the same spot. 
which is we wanted to be able to swim in the water so our bodies are streamlined and we have fins but it doesn't mean we're related to one another so that's convergent evolution so that's the cautionary tale don't assume that they're same species just because they're dealing with that that same environment what kind of structures are those it starts with an a analogous, analogous structures good all right um, um, Okay, so you could look at this as they ended in the same spot, convergent evolution, but these would have an ancestral mammal-like species, early mammal at the beginning of the Cenozoic era that they could have all branched out from in order to end up at that same spot. So you could end up, but usually you're gonna call that parallel evolution because we ended up traveling the same road and we had an ancestor, common ancestor. Then the last part was about speed. Okay, so there was phyletic gradualism, and what word do you hear in that? Gradual. Yeah, so it's slowly acc accumulating changes. You're gonna see a lot of transitional forms along the way, whereas punctuated equilibrium happens rapidly, and by rapidly we mean like a million years, so you're not gonna see as many um, um, transitional species within that. Okay, so that was the, oh, no, I have more, I have more. Okay, then we talked about um, developmental genes and macroevolution. I'm gonna, I think I owe you, is this the one where I owe you the video? No, it's the next one. Okay, so this is looking at kind of taking a step back. If you're seeing similarities and they study embryology in this, you're looking at the segmentation that we have and it's very, very similar. Where is that? When you look at the segmentation between um, a mammal and Drosophila fruit fly, you can see similar genes which are coding like anterior, posterior, um, um, proximal, distal, developmental. And so that's, that's something that's conserved, these control regions that maybe code for transcription factors, that's something that's conserved and is also evidence towards evolution. You remember the three anatomical pieces of evidence we looked at? What were they? Vestigial structures embryological and homologous structure. So this would be embryological, but this also points to biochemical, right? Because similar DNA means you're coding for similar traits. So that would also be biochemical evidence as well. We looked at whatever kind of eye you're gonna have, it's the same. The genes that code for an eye, it might be different variations of being some sort of photoreceptor, but, in, but it's the same genes that control that. Um, we looked at similar genes. You don't have to memorize. TBX5, don't spend time memorizing that, okay? The big idea is that we have similar genes coding for similar developmental processes, no matter if you're a fruit fly or a human. That's what I want you to walk away with that. And then just the, the I don't want you to have the miss, uh, the, what do I wanna call it, the mistakes um, that sometimes get perpetrated. So this is not evolution. And if you ever Google evolution, I guarantee this picture will come up at some point when you Google evolution. And so this is like saying this was the beginning and now here is the end when actually it's spreading out and we have common ancestors to chimp. We, a chimp is not our ancestor, but we would share a common ancestor. So that's why I wanted to talk to you about that. And then that is the end of chapter 17. Is there anything on 17 you want me to talk about? I'm allergic. I'm allergic to something. Okay, don't save. Okay, now on chapter 18, the big thing here was okay, now we understand how evolution can occur. We understand how speciation could occur, but how would we even have any kind of life? So we need to set the scene for early conditions on Earth. Oh, what was the, what do we call where we all, the first life form and everything else developed from it? What do we call that? Luca. Luca. Good. Last universal common ancestor. So um, the idea is how could all of this come about? Let's see if we can remember without me even putting a single thing on the screen. Okay. So first of all, how old is our, uh, is the earth? 4.6 billion. Okay. Billions, billions, billions. Most of the life that we talk about, you know, when we talk about all the different biological evolution, that's gonna be in the millions. Yeah, okay? 
So, but the bulk of the Earth's time is all in the billions, right? When we when we go back, we have 4.6 billion years. How how much time occurred before you had your first cell? About a billion years, right? Because the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and when did when did we get our first life form? Yeah, 3.5 billion years. So a billion years worth of time took place before we had our first cell. Do you think our first cell was a prokaryote or a eukaryote? Why? They're less complex. Eukaryotic cells are larger. And we know how a eukaryotic cell could have evolved from a prokaryotic cell, right? What do we call that? In the symbiotic hypothesis. We're not there. So the first cell was probably prokaryotic. Was it an autotroph or a heterotroph? Heterotroph. Because it's easier just to consume than make and consume, right? Okay, so first cell, prokaryotic, heterotroph. Um, now, let's talk about how we could get to that first cell. Before we can do biological evolution, what kind of evolution did we need to do? Chemical, Chemical evolution. So the conditions of early Earth, what kind of gases could we have in the environment? Gases that came out of what? Volcanoes. Volcanoes. And we would have? rain because our distance from the sun allows water to exist in all three states right as a liquid as a gas and as a solid yes okay so do this with me or do you feel like you need to type do you feel like you need to type okay you type i'll do the dance okay so early earth we had what were these representing plates are moving right sometimes plates come together and it mountains. builds mountains sometimes like an oceanic plate meets a continental plate and you get a subduction zone and when you have that subduction zone you could have a volcano now volcano is releasing gases but one of the gases it's not releasing is what oxygen. now it, there is oxygen in water so be careful how you say that what do I want you to say like no free oxygen no O2 you go no free oxygen and the benefit of that is it's a what kind of environment then reducing, reducing environment so a reducing environment is all about building and it's preventing decay. Now with our oxidizing environment that we have now due to the oxygen revolution, which was about how long ago? 2.3 billion years ago or so. Um, due to the oxygen revolution, we have an oxidizing em environment. It tends to break things down. It tends to decay. Then no decay, no free oxygen. No decay, no free oxygen. All right. So Outgassing from volcanoes, rainwater, now we have what? Ocean. So we have these inorganic molecules in there. We want to form simple organic molecules like simple what? Monomers. monomers. Name some monomers for me. Nucleic Not nucleic acids. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Amino acids, what else? Nucleotides, what? Sugars, good. So how do we go from inorganic to more complex, organic, simple building blocks? We would need to have some what? Energy, Energy to catalyze those reactions. Why? Because we don't have any what yet? We don't have any enzymes to facilitate those reactions. So we have to do abiotic synthesis of organic molecules. Abiotic synthesis of organic molecules. So no life, no enzymes yet. So where can our energy come from? Lightning, and we have no ozone. ozone layer, so we could have UV radiation and molten magma and radiation from the Earth's core, all providing energy for us to build our simple building blocks, our organic molecules. And that same kind of energy, right, is what can also take our simple organic molecules and go from monomers into what? Polymers. What are the four important organic molecules that we're super concerned about? Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Of those, which one are just, mm, got to have them? Nucleic acids and proteins, right? And so there's a whole thing about proteins first. Remember who said that? Fox. Fox. Foxanoids, fo foxanoids, I have a new word. Fox's protonoid microsphere, right? So he would say, you could take hot proteins and cool them and form spheres, and that could be the beginning of a barrier. So you have the beginnings of something going on inside the cell is different from an outside of the cell. That's a protocell starting with a protein sphere. 
Now, Oprin is the one who hypothesized about this whole early Earth and how you could build, you know, simple and then more complex molecules. But who's the guy who did the experiment in like a week's time, less than two weeks' time? What was his name? Miller. Miller, Miller time. Okay. He was able to form those organic molecules. So he's the one, and then Uri later um, was able to build those those um, amino acids and simple sugars within a week week's time. So there's also Oprin's Quasarvit droplets, and Oprin's, this is beautiful, who made this? Who's this? <laughs> Oprin's Quasarvit droplets are like fat layers, right? Fat layers, and um, probably it's somewhere in between the two. Who's the one who said nucleic acids and proteins could have developed at the same time? On clay. Karen Smith, yes. <laughs> you see it, you see that picture. Um, as far as um, what came first, proteins or nucleic acids, a lot of evidence is pointing to what though, coming first? RNA, RNA for coming first, because RNA can act as a enzyme and it can also, oh it can substrate too, but it can also store information. It can store the genetic code. When you go from being a protocell to a true cell about 3.6 billion years ago, you were self-replicating, self-replicating cell, okay, that's able to pass that information. So that went on about 3.6 billion years ago, then maybe about 1.7 or so billion years ago, maybe you got the first eukaryotic cell, oh, I skipped 2.3 billion years ago, you had the oxygen, oxygen revolution. revolution. You went from doing cyclic photophosphorylation to non-cyclic photophosphorylation. What's the significance of non-cyclic? Because you split water and you generate oxygen and it changed to an oxidizing environment. So now it changed because now the environment is all about decay because of the oxygen in the air. And this is why you don't have life evolving out of little puddles in your backyard. Okay, and did you learn? Who's this boy? Did you learn? Is this your friend? Yeah. What's your name? Michael. Michael, did you learn something today? Yeah. Well, okay, yeah. good job, Michael. <laughs> Way to be an AP biologist. Okay, sorry to put you on the spot. That's all right. Okay, <laughs> have a good afternoon, Michael. You too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, um, <laughs> so cute. <laughs> I did learn, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm like a boss. Okay, um, I got lost. Okay, oxygen revolution, prokaryotic. Oh, okay, so now um, let's talk about time periods, okay, time periods. So um, the bulk of the Earth's time was spent at what time? What do we call that time period? Pre-Cambrian. Pre and that's because the first period in the Paleozoic era is called Cambrian, so everything before that is pre-Cambrian, right? So let's review our times on our eras. So this moment right now, um, the era that we're living in right now is called the Cenozoic era. Cenozoic, center of your world. It's this moment, this moment, this moment. Savannah knows this as well. Back how long? 65 million years ago. Okay. Now, this demarcation right here of the Cenozoic, you're going to have things on either side. I just want to keep in mind. At the end, what's the era that comes right before the Cenozoic era? Mesozoic, Mesozoic era. So. At the end of the Mesozoic era, you have early mammals, right? So you're gonna start, did I say the end of the Mesozoic? I can't remember what I'm saying. And so at the beginning of the Cenozoic era, you have early mammals, right? It, there, it's like that, right, the, the evolution of mammals is happening right at that demarcation zone between Mesozoic and Cenozoic, right? And we're going from um, early angiosperms, right? You end with early angiosperms at the end of the Mesozoic. That's what you're starting with at the beginning of the Cenozoic era, right? And then you go from early angiosperms all the way up to what? Herbs. Herbs. Okay. And then before the Cenozoic era is the Mesozoic. So it ended 65 million years ago. When did it start? Yeah. And how are we remembering that? When school's out. Okay. And before the Mesozoic was the old and pale. And it ended when? Ended when? Yeah, and started when? About 42. 42 million years ago, right? And everything before that, right, was the uh, Precambrian. Now, on the cusp now of the Paleozoic, I'm Precambrian looking into Paleozoic and stepping right into the beginnings of the Paleozoic era. Animal-wise, 
What's our development level at this point? I am multicellular, I'm an invertebrate, okay? So you're gonna go from invertebrates in the Paleozoic era to what? Vertebrates, to fish, to amphibians, and then you're gonna go all the way up to early reptiles, okay? So there's a lot of life that happened. Um, it's just an explosion of life, because keep in mind, as you become multicellular, organisms are crawling out and living on land, and there's not a lot of competition up there, so they're just, you know, all these organisms are, this is a huge radiation of organisms. Okay, plant-wise, we're going from algae, and we're going from simple plants all the way up to the beginnings of gymnosperms. Because when we think about the Mesozoic era, what were we imagining? Was this the class dinosaurs. that I did? Yeah, dinosaurs running around Christmas tree. Okay, <laughs> that's how I, I, was it your class that I did that in? Yeah, no, her class, <laughs> zero period. So Mesozoic era in the middle, just to think about dinosaurs running around a Christmas tree or a Hanukkah bush, okay? I'm like, I can't put up the ornament, okay? <laughs> so um, that's the Mesozoic era. You have gymnosperms um, and become our dominant, reptiles are dominant in the Mesozoic era. At the end of the Mesozoic era, oh, criminy. Yes, then you have the, um, in the Paleozoic, gymnosperms, then angiosperms, and now we have the beginnings of, what did I say? I don't know how to do this one. Herbs, good. Okay, um, you want to look for, like, I want you to, oh my gosh, I just want you to think of the bookends of the two. Okay, let's make sure I hit everything. Is this the chapter we did, Evidence of Evolution? I can't remember anything. Oh, okay, okay. Did we finish? Oh, we, I don't think we finished we the notes for chapter 18. We have a few notes to discuss. Oh, yeah, I was going to do some notes at the end of that. We talked also about relative and out. Yes? Uh, I think a note for page 12. Oh, okay. We also talked about relative and absolute dating. What's today? The 12th? Put the time on it. Put your name and put the time on it. Okay. Um, so, um, relative dating is just saying fossils in the in the lower strata are what older. Fossils in the newer uh, the the strata on top are newer, right? When we talk about absolute dating, we're talking about rate of decay, right? So if I say my half life is ten years, right? you would expect half of that sample to have decayed within 10 years, right? If another 10 years goes by, now I'm down to not a half of the sample, but a quarter. If another 10 years goes by, I'm down to a eighth. If another 10 years goes by, I'm down to a relative to the rest of the sample. Remember how we talked about it's a ratio between isotopes and a, a stable isotope is not going to decay. Um, carbon-12 is not going to decay, but carbon-14 is. So at the point where an organism dies, it has all the carbon-12, all, all the carbon-14 it's ever going to have, then that carbon-14 is going to be decaying, whereas the carbon-12 isn't. So you'll have more carbon-12 and less carbon-14, right? Okay, and so from knowing how fast carbon breaks down, we can tell how old it is based on the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, because it, it breaks down at a regular time and fashion. So if something's super old, we have to pick a different isotope in order to do that. Okay, that was relative, go ahead. Were you gonna ask a question? I thought I saw, okay. I went through that part, right? Yes. Um, I just have a quick question, like on the actual notes. Yes, go um, away, go, I mean, go ahead. <laughs> go away. There's a section in tiny print and we'll Tell me where it is and I'll talk to you about it. It's on the bottom of chapter 18. It says from the study guide. But do we need to know all that stuff for the Yes, quiz? you do. For the quiz. Yeah, because I just copied it and pasted it in. So okay. yes, you do need to know. Okay. Yeah. I just copied and pasted it in because there were no resources for you to to get for that other other than that. Okay, all right, and then I will go over whatever I am at the end of those notes, I'll review that with you, 
and then you'll have time and then take your quiz and study. You don't have that lab to turn in. You, we have time to do that later. So it's just a matter of finishing the notes and taking the quiz, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Swedish. Make good choices, have good evenings. Have a piece of toast. Mm -hmm.